Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and, and dear colleagues, um, I'm extremely pleased to be here, and I'm honored uh, to have been invited by, by Laurent Götschel and, and Swiss Peace to address this conference. And I'm particularly pleased to, to have been given the right to respond to Michael Muller uh, this morning. I haven't heard you, but I have my spies all over the place, and uh, they briefed me before and while you spoke uh, about what happened this morning. Um, I'm sure you have heard this numerous times already uh, since 9 o'clock. Uh, this year is an important year for the UN. The organization celebrates its 70th anniversary when a number of important reviews and policy events converge, uh, namely the one on peace operations, the one on peace building, uh, on post-2015, on climate change, on women, peace and security, on R2P. I also want to mention the UN Global Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism, which will be presented at the General Assembly later this year as well as the preparatory work leading to the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. Of all these reviews, the so-called HIPPO report, the, re the review of the high-level panel on peace operations, rightly underscored the critical need for the primacy of policy politics. In other words, political solutions should always and unconditionally guide the design and deployment of any UN peace operation. It also underlined that the responsibility of member states to mobilize political support to keep pre uh, peace processes on track is vital. It is not surprising that this morning and also at the just uh, recent opening of the General Assembly this year, one, if not the buzzword, uh, was prevention. Numerous statements uh, two weeks ago and declarations by heads of states and their foreign ministers proved that there, is, there might be some sort of emerging understanding of what pre prevention means in terms of action in the UN system and of the US, UN system as a whole. This morning, I want to respond to Michael's remarks, but I also want to share with you some impressions that I took back from New York, uh, from the high-level summit uh, that started on 28th of September and is still ongoing. There are namely three issues uh, that I want to highlight. First, there is the role of the Security Council and how it engages with the UN system. The UN Charter gives the Security Council primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Today, and in the wake of the most dramatic humanitarian crisis since World War II, we are inclined to say that the Security Council has spectacularly failed to fulfill its mandate. Critics see in this a proof that permanent membership and the veto do not reflect geopolitical realities anymore. I also want to highlight that Switzerland has for over a decade called on the permanent members to voluntarily renounce on their veto in cases of genocide and other serious crimes, just as the French initiative aims at limiting the use of the veto in cases of mass atrocities. And we do this because we believe that the Security Council, and with it the UN system, is losing its leadership role at the moment when it is the most needed. Reform of the Security Council's working methods could therefore be one way forward, and we believe they are one way forward. But such reforms are vital, but they will not overcome automatically the absence of political consensus and of political will. Because we have to be realistic, the veto is not a privilege, it is meant to be an obligation. Agreement between all relevant global and regional powers is essential to keep pro peace processes on track. And consensus among the Council's permanent members was in 1945 seen as the best way to ensure necessary political support in situations of conflict. I believe we all agree, or I hope we all agree, that there can be no military solution to a crisis like Syria today. And even if there were a military solution, and even if the Security Council agreed on it, 
there will be no takers among troop contributors for such a massive and robust intervention. So in other words, since Rwanda and Srebrenica, the international community has discussed and established a number of important concepts and instruments to prevent similar crimes in the future. I, I think about the ICC, the International Criminal Court, the concept of uh, responsibility to protect integrated missions, the peace-building architectures, the creation of the Human Rights Council. In 2005, at the same time as the peace-building architecture and the Human Rights Council were established, the international community reaffirmed that peace, human rights and sustainable development are interdependent and mutually reinforcing, and this was precisely uh, the theme that we discussed this fall at the General Assembly. Because the leitmotif of all this is prevention, and the Security Council has an important role to play in this regard. The Council will most likely never be in a position to mandate robust military action at the large scale. It must therefore develop strategic approaches on how to better engage with key institutions, not only the Secretariat, but with the Peace Building Commission, the Human Rights Council, the ICC, with special envoys and key regional organizations. The Council must continue to develop comprehensive long-term preventive strategies, for instance, on how to counter violent extremism and especially on how to prevent systematic and systemic human rights abuse. And this is one of the key reasons why we have been engaged in improving Security Council working methods, we, because we want the Security Council to become more accountable, more efficient, but we especially want the Security Council to focus on prevention rather than, than the aftermath of conflict. And second, there's the question wh whether the UN will be reaching its limits or is already reaching its limits. I think there are thousands, if not, not a million good reasons to celebrate the 2030 agenda. But there is also a great deal of skepticism whether the UN system is fit and ready to cope with the challenges ahead. We could ask, maybe someone else or another institution is better placed to do the UN's work. I personally believe that with 100, 120,000 personnel employed in a total of 16 peace operations, a peacekeeping budget of close to 8.5 billion, and over 57 million people in 22 countries needing humanitarian assistance, it is idle to ask whether we need the UN. The question should therefore be, what kind of UN do we need in the future? It is a question of adapting concepts and perceptions to operational realities. And this is why we are currently undergoing all these different reviews. And I'm sure Michael said it before, the UN was established as an intergovernmental organizations, organization. Its principles are, the, are national governments who act as members of political organs and governance structures of the various UN entities. But over the last years, vast changes have occurred as how much member states contribute to the UN and what they can ask of the UN in turn. This is visible, for instance, in the General Assembly's Budget and Finance Committee. This fall, the fifth committee, the said Budget Committee, will not only negotiate the next regular biennial budget, it will also call an it will also negotiate the so-called scale of assessment, which means they will negotiate how much every member state contributes to the UN's regular budget. First mechanic predictions show, that show a relative decline in assessed contributions by many traditional and namely EU donor countries. The EU's cumulative contribution will fall to 30.4 from previously around 35%. At the same time, at least some tra transitional or rising economies will have to pay more, especially China, which will move from sixth to third largest donor. These changes will be more consequential when it comes to voluntary contributions. By contributing extra budgetary support, and that's the large majority of contributions to the UN system, uh, uh, member states define the areas which they deem a priority. With traditional donors suffering from budgetary constraints, we hope that new donors will start contributing, but the question is, will these donors have the same priorities that we do? 
while traditional donors reduced their contributions due to budgetary constraints. The non-traditional, including non-governmental donors, will come in, and I hope they will come in. The Agenda 2030 will hopefully, and here I agree once more with Michael Muller, push the UN and its member states, and in particular its member states, to think out of the box and to reorient the discussion towards strategic partnerships with non-governmental entities, uh, civil society representatives, but also the private sector. In the same context, as an operational actor, the UN in the field has traditionally en engaged through or in agreement with the host government. But what if the national or local governments are weak or not willing and able to react? What if the legitimacy is impaired? I have a good example, because this year's Nobel Peace Prize not only celebrates democratic progress in Tunisia, it highlights the vital role of national civil society coalitions in preventing violent conflict. It's not only the role of human rights advocates or human rights defenders uh, that is put to the fore. It is the role of employers' associations and unions. And based on my own experience, I, I personally believe that that the role, for instance, of unions is largely underestimated, if, if not underemployed, in, in peace mediation. I think the UN system uh, has to be revisited uh, as a system of collective security that, that works towards inclusive and nationally owned peace that includes all actors, not only member states. And the third point, and, and by conclusion, will be the theme of recurring, the recurring theme of breaking the silos. I think we've been repeating for years that silos have been broken. It's not a new expression, and it's very common in every large governmental or even non-governmental organization. I'm convinced that in spite all good intentions of, of the current reviews, the principal structures of the UN will remain as they are, and I, I also think they should remain as as they are, because we don't want to open a Pandora's box. But nevertheless, a lot can be done to break the silos. I think we should first and foremost aim at improved networking systems, communication systems, and management systems for the UN and for its, me its member states. An issue-based collaboration between different entities is a possible wa way forward. There is the example of the global focal point on the rule of law, which is a collaboration be between the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the UN Development Program. There has been substantial progress already, and this model could be used for further issue areas. We also have to continue working on improved transitions between different forms of UN engagement, from peacekeeping to peace building, and from peace building to development, and, and acknowledging that they are all other names for more or less the same set of activities. Organizations like Swiss Peace uh, help looking at best practice. And I think the collaboration in, in, uh, with Swiss Peace is particularly important in that respect. Moreover, the question of how conflicts erupt and how they are financed should, uh, should automatically force us to bring systems together. I've talked before about connecting the Security Council with the Human Rights Council. This is an area that we will focus on in the, in the coming months uh, with, with special attention. But there is also the area of combating transnational organized crime, including financing for terrorism, human trafficking, and trade of cultural goods. These complex challenges posed by non-state terrorist groups funded through organized crime leading to massive migration flows that again feed systems of illegal trafficking will not be overcome if we don't bring the necessary expertise together, expertise that to date has been spread over various state ministries and various UN entities and programs. We are working on building task forces and working groups internally to bring this ex expertise together, and at the same time the UN should focus on on similar systems of how better connecting UN organizations with to which to date have not been naturally connected with the issue of conflict prevention, but play a crucial role. I think about UNESCO, 
about UNODC, the UN Programme on Drugs and Crime, or the UN uh, Treaty uh, Against Corruption. The collaboration between, between all, even marginal UN uh, funds and programs, uh, organ political organs and, and agencies have to be strengthened. Geneva is ideally placed, and, and I think we, we, we very much agree on that. Geneva is ideally placed to, to foster this collaboration because Geneva, as, as, as a place, as, as a hub, unites numerous hundreds of, of different actors, not only state actors, but also civil society actors, think tanks and universities. But I think we should connect Geneva with other UN hubs and other international hubs. We should connect New York with Geneva. We should connect Geneva with Vienna. We should connect Vienna with Nairobi and vice versa. We have to strive for more capillaries between the different governance hubs and their expertise. The new Agenda 2030, and Goal 16 in particular, gives us new momentum to rethink uh, not only Geneva's role, but our role as a member state and as a, as a community of practitioners and, and, and like-minded on how to push this agenda further. Where do we come from uh, when we talk about the Swiss contribution to all this? Since joining uh, the UN in 2002, Switzerland has always prioritized the so-called soft security capacities uh, of the UN. We have engaged in strengthening the funding and backstopping of so-called political missions and of institutional entities that focus on mediation and conflict prevention. It is not only about money, but it is about money, because without money, the UN will not be capable of strengthening these institutions. And this is where we have to seize the opportunity of the current reviews. The international community is still investing far more, by far more money into the aftermath of conflict, in the combating terrorism, instead of preventing conflict and preventing terrorism. UN's activities in the area of prevention are still largely funded by voluntary contributions. We have been for years engaged within the UN Budgetary Committee, but all other UN entities, to strengthening the budgetary processes towards bringing more money into the system of prevention. We have been the first country paying a voluntary contribution of uh, 500,000 Swiss francs uh, to the Mediation Support Unit in New York to get it going and we've been contributing to it uh, ever since and we, we are happy to see that other countries uh, con continue to contribute as well and continue to contribute much more even than we do. We have uh, again taken a step forward by establishing a mediation unit or at least a mediation cell uh, with the office of the Director General in Geneva and I, I believe that this has helped us strengthening the collaboration in Geneva between the UN, between us, between all relevant actors in Geneva in hosting peace processes on Syria, on Yemen, on Libya uh, that will hopefully lead uh, to a positive outcome uh, someday. There are numerous activities uh, between our division on UN uh, and international organizations and the Human Security Division in the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. And there's an increasing amount of development money going into the question of fragile states and uh, preventing violent conflict. I think we don't have the time to, <laughs> to give you the full list. I have it here and I'm happy to answer more questions.